E. I'm Laura Boyle, and I have the pleasure of serving on the Board of Directors for Child Care Resources. And I'm just here to welcome and thank you for being here, and then also introduce our um, moderator for today's fabulous panel. It's um, Ms. Martina Winston, who is an energetic, passionate human resources professional with over 15 years of experience. She's a vice president and senior HR partner with Protective Life for almost seven years now. And Martina spends her time coaching senior and executive leaders through HR strategic business support around people, talent, succession, planning, and engagement. She also leads Protective's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts while also managing global talent programs in partnership with Protective's parent, Daichi, Daichi, life based in Tokyo, Japan. Not only is Martina passionate about her work, but she's also extremely engaged in her community. As a lover of fitness, Martina has been part of Zumba Fitness for over 10 years. She volunteers in, um, with many organizations such as the Junior League of Birmingham, where she was recently slated as the 101st president elect. She's also worked with organizations like United Way, the Colette Jewish Family Services, Baptist Health Foundation, and many more. She's served as the chair of the Marketing and PR Committee for the Board of Directors at Child Care Resources, where she's still active with us today. And Martina is from the south side of Chicago, and she currently lives in Pelham with her family. So Martina, welcome, and thank you so much for heading up this great event today. Um, and look forward to hearing about um, our panelists from you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I really um, I'm excited about the opportunity to join you on this Wednesday. It is officially afternoon. So happy Wednesday afternoon to you all. I know we say that this is coffee with ED, but just have something to keep you fueled. So I've got my diet Dr. Pepper here. I'm not a coffee drinker. Joan has her water. Um, so we just wanna make sure that you all have something to join us. And I'm glad that you have an opportunity to be with us this afternoon. Um, our nation's long-term well-being depends on our childcare infrastructure that works for every family. And as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a, um, I live in Pelham, I have two children, and when I think about the structure that was provided to help me um, be active, not only in my community, but also a professional, I don't know how I would have done it without good structure and support um, in the child care network. So definitely my hats off um, to organizations such as Child Care Resources to really help to create a great foundation. So when I go off to work, my family and my kids um, are safe and sound and learning. So quality and affordable child care is critical to our economic recovery now and in the future. And when you think about what we've experienced, of course, over the last 18 months, this is now so more important than it's ever been. So again, glad that we have resources like child care to help us. We know that high quality child care isn't just essential to the workforce today, but it also drives academic achievement and other measurable short and long-term improvements to health, social development in children that prepare our skilled workforce of tomorrow. We've got to make sure those kids are right. So when they come to me, um, then we know that they've got the structure and the foundation, the education um, that they deserve in order for them to be really good, thriving and successful people in their careers. As we all know, COVID-19 hit us hard, and it was a huge crisis um, that had a tremendous impact on child care across the country, affecting the financial, mental, and emotional state of children, families, and child care providers across the world. Today, we will hear from two early education experts, along with licensed psychologists, as they share their thoughts on the potential lasting impacts of the pandemic on children and families. Well, we can expect our community to go from here 
and recommendations to ensuring children continue to receive in the highest level of early education opportunities possible. We've got the right people here today to help us understand what are some of the things that have impacted our community over the last 18 months or so, and where are we gonna go in the future? So we will be sure to open the floor for Q&A at the end. So don't worry, you'll have an opportunity to get your questions out there. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box throughout our discussion. So I would love to introduce to you um, our three panelists that we have with us this afternoon. Dr. Felicia Houston looks back on almost a 20 year career as she realizes that each experience positive or negative was strengthening her resolve and honing her skills to access, support, advocate, and link pivotal services to achieve great outcomes for those she serves. Dr. Houston is a licensed psychologist in the state of Alabama, and she received her doctorate of psychology degree from the great University of Alabama, Roll Tide. She then completed two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Center for Development and Learning. Her concentration included autism spectrum disorders, clinical consultation, neurodevelopment evaluations, clinical psycholo psycholo psychological assessments, program development, early intervention, and family services. Dr. Houston provides diagnostic and clinical services to school systems, families, and agencies. She conducts parent trainings, teacher trainings, as well as educate parents on appropriate curriculum and interventions. She works with school systems to help assist in developing the most individualized programs for students. And she also has designed programs for children with special needs, assessing, assessing, diagnosing, and developing interventions for various clinical populations. She is the real deal. <laughs> she has served simultaneously as administrator, supervisor, trainer, and um, clinical technician. And in 2016, Dr. Houston st started her own practice, Links to Learning Consultant, Consulting LLC, and she de is dedicated to continuing her comprehensive services to those in need. If you all all give a virtual warm wave to Dr. Houston, thank you for thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you so very much. I'm actually happy to be asked to do this, so thank you. Absolutely. Next, we have Dr. Ty Moody, someone else coming from you from the north, who was born in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Moody's dedication to education has been relentless. With an extensive background in community leadership, elementary education, educational leadership, and instructional reading for grades K through 12, her desire to develop and implement strategies to help students achieve greatness and increase knowledge and skill have taken her from role of substitute teacher to college professor. As a student at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Sorry, roll tide. Dr. Moody attained both bachelor and bachelor and master's degree in education. Her pursuit for higher education continued with a specialist degree in ed administration. And in 2008, she received and achieved her doctor, her doctorate of education in organizational leadership from Nova, Nova Southern um, Eastern University. Dr. Moody has worked tirelessly with others to develop strategic plans for school success, creates initiatives for school-wide reading awareness, and chair forums to encourage stakeholders to work together continuously with continuous schools and process improvement. Now a resident of Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Moody assists her husband and my pastor, I don't even know if she knows, knows this, but Dr. <laughs> um, pastor Vanderbilt, Moody the second with many facets in their ministry as a leader of the worship center Christian church women's ministry Dr. Moody teaches classes and annual annually hosts hosts the worship centers women's empowerment weekend most recently Dr. Ty established Einstein's playground a children's learning and development center with locations housed inside the worship center Bessemer and Derby campuses in addition to her full-time responsibilities as a wife of a senior pastor and founder of the Worship Center Christian Church, 
her greatest joy is having the ability to nurture and care for her two children, Eden and Ethan. Another virtual welcome for Dr. Tiny. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored. Absolutely. And last but not least, we have our very own ED, our Executive Director of Child Care Resources, which is a nonprofit child care resource and referral agency um, supported by the United Way of Central Alabama, partner serving Central Alabama. Under her leadership, the agency achieved national quality assurance for best practices from child care aware of America. Prior to joining Child Care Resources, Joan served, uh, jo Joan served as the first Success by Six director for the United Way of Central Alabama. And during her time there, she successfully developed, implemented, and expanded a reading ready readiness initiative for four-year-olds attending local child care Head Start and Head Start programs. She has presented at child care provider conferences, including the Smart Start North Carolina, United Way campaign events, and elite, elite athlete swim clinics. Child care is a professional industry that provides service to working families. High quality child care is essential for supporting Alabama's workforce and puts children on the path to success. And we are such so honored to have Dr. Houston, Dr. Moody, and Joan right here. Um, and we can't wait to hear what experiences and what knowledge they have. And again, let's give a virtual welcome to our executive director, Joan Wright. <laughs> All right, ladies, well, let's get into it because I'm sure our folks are ready to hear um, your experience and share some of your knowledge. Um, and as, as I shared earlier, you know, COVID-19 has really put um, a strain on families and child care providers across the state. So the first question any of you um, are, are, are welcome to answer this question is, what do you believe to be the greatest challenge facing the child care industry today or the mental health and well-being of children and families at the moment? Is it okay if I start? Please, Dr. Houston, thank you. Yes. You know, when I, this question, um, it really makes me um, think a lot because, and you said the biggest challenge. And so one of the things, honestly, that I know over, especially over the past 18 months, you know, with um, the pandemic and how everything that just shut down just so completely and quickly that it did not give anyone a chance to prepare, right? And then I'm looking at, did, having to work with families and provide different types of resources, that to me has been the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges facing in terms of lack of resources and also the access to information on how do we get the information to parents so they will be able to um, get those services or request those services. That has been the, one of the major things over the past for me. Um, and it is significant because I have worked with a lot of different parents. They would say, I didn't even know that was a possibility or I didn't even know, I don't even know where to start, you know, and if you don't have that information or educating the families on services, then it, it doesn't go any further than that. So that would, that has been one of the biggest um, challenges I see facing. And I like to add um, to that the lack of resources is the lack of preparedness. You know, it happened so abruptly, you know, we couldn't even get prepared to give the resources, right? It just happened. We were like, wait, oh, it's it's happening over there. Wait, we have to close down next week? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was it happened so fast that we weren't prepared to properly resource our families. Um, we had to kind of make things happen so fast. It just, we, we weren't prepared as a country. We weren't prepared as organizations. We just weren't prepared, you know, tech, technology wise, we weren't prepared. We just weren't prepared. So I think we were just the lack of preparedness, I think is kind of where we stood, um, especially as early childhood, you know, and, and higher ed, it's a little different. They were like, oh, just kind of go home. I had, you know, you know, people come in and say, well, why don't you guys kind of do like higher ed? I'm like, people are not going to pay us 
to teach classes online, like they're trying to work. And a two year old, I can't teach a class online for a two year old for six hours. That's just not going to work. And so just the, the thought process is for just even providing for our families effectively. It was so I would just say the lack of preparedness to try to make that shift during um, COVID when everything shut down is what I would say. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, um, you know, point that, that that both of you brought up. And so when you think about the lack of preparedness and, and the lack of access to resources, even think about just the preparedness of the mental and well-being and the physical. Mm -hmm. um, would either of you like to elaborate on kind of how that really impacted our ability um, to, to be able to be there mentally and physically and emotionally, um, not only for, you know, our, our families that were, you know, in the homes with us stuck, but even those, you know, outside. But Joan, I, I think you, you raised your hand. You've got some things to share. Right. Thank you, Martina. And I, what I would add to that is um, the disruption. Um, you know, children and really even adults for that matter, but particularly young children take comfort in routines, yes. schedules, familiarity. And when we were all so abruptly interrupted, um, you know, last year, and still there's several disruptions that continue even to this day, that I think was very unsettling to young children. And um, even again to school age children, it was unsettling to the adults working in the field because now they're thinking, what do I do about my job? Um, you know, some of them even probably had career thoughts about is this even the right career for me anymore? Um, we know that because today the child care workforce is in, in my estimation disproportionately affected by the pandemic still today. I know we have a few child care providers on our call today. And I think they would agree with me that they continue to struggle with their child care workforce, with getting um, people interested in uh, getting interviewed even, or um, you know, thinking of even taking a job in child care because a, a lot of people see this industry as a high risk area. And so I would add to the unpreparedness is the disruption, the disruption of routines, schedules, familiarity, especially for young children. And they're thrown into chaos for a little bit. And yeah. child care was thrown into chaos, having to quickly adjust, adapt. And, and like Dr. Moody said, you can't just put a two-year-old in front of a screen. In fact, it's not even healthy. The American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't even recommend screen time for children two and under. It, it's not as easy to then virtually interact with a child. And they still need supervision regardless. They still need supervision. And they really prefer the face-to-face -face interaction with, with a caring adult. You know, Joan, thank you. I think you're absolutely right. That that disruption is huge and it's continuing as we're seeing a shift really in our environment. And so I want to go to the next question because I think that um, you led us here really nicely. And that's where have you seen the most change in child care and in the workforce industry in the past year? I know we're seeing a huge shift. This is not the same workforce we left in March 2020. It's completely different. Um, so would, would love to throw that question out. Um, what is the most change we've seen in child care and in the workforce industry in the past year? I'll, I'll start the response to that. I think the biggest change is that we have seen child care have to really adjust um, outside of their normal comfort zone. Um, let me make a couple of points there. Several child care programs shut down completely and to this day have never reopened um, because of staffing challenges, because of challenges of families feeling comfortable to return to care, um, being uncertain of the health and safety of the environment, and because so many families had to adjust for so long to working from home, many families found other ways to take care of their children. Either they were able to flex with their employer and keep their children at home with them, and then they realized, hey, I just had a huge bonus in my pay because Child care has cost me several thousand dollars a year, and if I can find a way to be able to take care of them at home and still work, then I'm getting a, a bonus, if you will. So I think um, that is the biggest thing we know, um, and, and we do have a representative from DHR on the call, and we're very glad to be a DHR, Alabama Department of Human Resources quality contractor for the Central Alabama area. We know that roughly 10 to 12 percent of child care across Alabama has never reopened. 
Now we've had some brave individuals actually start a new child care business, believe it or not, during this pandemic time. Um, and you know, there's still time to see how well they're going to be able to do in this new environment. Um, but roughly 10 to 12 percent of child care across Alabama is, is gone. And that means those children don't have a place. Those staff are, are not there and probably have left the child care field. Um, you hear a lot of people doing gig jobs now. So I think the pandemic forced people to reevaluate their current lifestyle, their current life choices, their career choices, and look at well, what else can I do now that will allow me some more flexibility um, and still provide a meaningful income to support my family. Um, certainly the additional, and I know we're going to talk about um, funds uh, here in a little bit, but certainly additional supports that still continue this day, the child care tax credits, um, DHR has made some adjustments to their child care subsidy payments to help families continuing to manage um, the pandemic, as well as really child care providers to have a little bit more substantial steady stream of income through regular um, full payments through the subsidy program. Different efforts like that have been taken to offset these continuing challenges of the pandemic on child care. And thank you. Thank you, Joe. I, um, I can't say anything honestly to add much more to that because Joan was very comprehensive and in summing it all up. I mean, that's exactly um, it um, that I know that I have seen, you know, in terms of for child care um, and the workforce as well, you know, um, and, and even coming back in terms of having individuals that if they're interested in and quite honestly, you know, when I go into different systems and let's just say children need everything from like different types of intervention strategies or things implemented, the um, the concern with having individuals having backgrounds in terms like for behavior, behavior management, those types of things as well. So again, um, Joan hit it, right? Yes. <laughs> He said it best. Yes. So, Dr. Houston, you just brought up something that I think is interesting, and we can kind of pivot um, <clears throat> because we know, obviously, that, that this has just been such a difficult time, and and the 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 need to have to pivot to think about how you're going to support yourself and your family differently. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Joan. That families have really had to take a step back to think about, you know, what is the most you know, utmost important thing, and maybe the thing that I was doing for mm -hmm. years and years and years might not be the thing that I need to do today. Exactly. And how do I pivot and how to make that shift? So, um, would love to, to get your thoughts, ladies, on how might the stress of the pandemic mm -hmm. affect? Let's go to the mental, the mental health um, of children and parents. What are, what have you all have seen in in your line of work on the mental stability um, of our community? I think Joan in maybe it was the first question she used the word chaotic or chaos. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, in terms of and I'm just being honest in terms of when it first started, I had to take a step back and reevaluate and look at things and going at things differently. Because let's just say um, if I was working with um, like a, a head start or a preschool program, right, that had never gone virtual on anything before. And with the expectation that if you have a child, even a so-called neurotypical child that, you know, didn't have a lot of, of issues, let's just say sitting or attending, but you have a special needs child, let's just say diagnosed with a developmental delay, autism spectrum with some behavioral issues as well, that becomes even more challenging. And we're doing that to parents that may have to take over the role of that along with everything shutting down that you are looking to reevaluate, you know, um, what do I need to do? Again, in terms of what Joan said, you know, reevaluating, um, doing flex time from work and different things like that. But then putting all that in terms of on the parents, it has created and did create a lot of stress. Now, you know, um, and I'll cut this short because I could talk on this forever in terms of like for regarding, you know, mental health and stress. Everyone has stress from time to time. We're to, that's more of a healthy type of stress. But we're talking about something that is consistent, that is like it was, and for something that within our lifetimes we have never had to deal with. 
you know, that for a lot of different um, individuals that I work with, that also went on into like a more anxiety, depression. And if there were any issues, and I'm talking about with families, with parents, with um, the guardians, if there was already something pre-existing, that just exacerbated the condition as well. And then again, with my thing earlier with um, not knowing how to find resources, and then you have this like, you've created this like chaotic little bubble that then you have to go in as best you can because you're not face to face. And you have to try to then again, and I have, this has um, really taught me in terms of to really, really, really think outside the box and in terms of, you know, how to provide services via, um, you know, virtual and different things like that. So what I have seen um, in terms of how the pandemic has affected is in terms of there has been less resiliency, um, you know, in terms of when things come, come up because um, like Dr. Moody said, the lack of preparation. And if you, if you're having difficulty and then everyone else, even those that are, let's just say within government or whatever, that are also trying to figure out, figure it out. That's a lot that you're having on you as a parent, um, to a child that has um, special needs as well. So I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of that. No, thank you, um, Dr. Houston. You know, one thing that I think you mentioned is just that emotional toll on on families. And so when you think about the pandemic and what's happened is that, you know, unfortunately children were losing family members, moms and dads and the impact of COVID. I mean, that's a lot for a child to have yeah. to, um, you know, think about also trying to be fed you know, from an educational um, perspective, I think it's it's really huge and something that, again, talk about being prepared, Dr. Moon. We weren't prepared for that. Right. Um, and usually, you know, we, we usually try to shield our children from those heartaches and pains, but it was everywhere they turned around. And in some cases, they were impacted, you know, by it as well. So, so Dr. Moody, um, as I think about your experience and the things that you do, I would love to hear your predictions for the financial, mental, and even emotional well-being for families with children specifically as we think about future, let's say the next five years. So for us, well, what I think personally, I, I wrote some notes. Um, the challenges for us moving on is just concerns with making sure our families follow and and sorry I was pausing because my computer went out for a second I don't know if I went out for a second but my computer went out but making sure um, our, our health and safety protocols um, moving forward that, that's been our biggest challenge and moving on forward in the future you know we have had families moving forward not want to follow some of the health and safety protocols. And they have even said, well, these are too strict. I, I don't know if I can, you know, make even want to follow these because every time, you know, my my child or son or daughter have a fever, I, I have to get them tested or, you know, because we have strict protocols to maintain the health and safety of all children and families, you know, which is what we speak to maintain the health and safety of everyone, not just your child, you know, they're like, that's a bit much. I don't want to do that. So, you know, as we're moving forward in this pandemic, which we try to remind everyone, we are still in a pandemic, yes. you know, um, we, we can't allow everyone to come inside the school and, you know, we do want this to be a family affair, but in this season, we just can't allow that. So some of those kind of conversations are very difficult. And so moving forward, trying to still create a community um, without um, and trying to allow our families to feel still feel apart um, and maintain healthy healthy protocols, I think has been the, the one of the greatest challenges moving forward. So. Make, making sure they still feel apart, but maintaining systems and protocols. And then also making sure um, we keep the early childhood a profession and not just something else to do in the meantime. I think that has been my biggest challenge. I've been in every um, stage of education, like uh, from elementary all the way to college. And it, baffles me how early childhood is looked upon as just 
leftovers. Like, and to me, it's the most important, the most vital. I'm like, the brain grows the most from zero to five. And this is the time that you put anybody in the classroom. Like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And so now I think we have to be so um, intentional about really investing our time, monies, and energies and putting um, the right people, the right, the right funding in, in, the, in this age group. And, and it just breaks my heart that I don't think we invest in, in early childhood as a whole. I think that we, um, I just don't, I think we look at it as, you know, something and I, and I get it. I get that it's, it, it's something that, um, parents do have to pay for, but I don't think parents should have to pay for it. It should be like, you know, grade school, whereas it should not be something that is so expensive that parents feel like, mm -hmm. you know, I can't go to work or it's so expensive. So, you know, I, I just struggle with it. And so I, I do have an, I, I do feel like it is not looked upon as a profession, early childhood that is. And so every child care is looked upon different based upon the zip code because it's based upon who can afford to pay 300 a week versus a hundred dollars a week. Yeah, no, you bring up a really good point and uh, we can hear and feel your passion. Like you say, you've been through all <laughs> the levels um, and, and it's, it's, it's people like you, Dr. Moody, that we really need to continue to be champion and allies um, for this profession because it's important. And, and Joe, when I think about, um, I see your hand raised, when I think about the work that you do to lead child care resources to be such a great resource to our city and even our state, by the way, if you at all don't know, Joan and the child care resources team really took to, I'm going to say, the network, the social media virtual network to really help to educate those in our state during the pandemic. I remember last year around this time, Joan was, uh, we called her famous Joan Wright because she was out trying to share all the things to help families in this time of need. So Joan, we'll love to hear your perspective as you think about predicting in the next five years, what do we need to be on the lookout for from a financial, mental, and emotional well-being for families with children? I think first job, I wanna um, add to what Dr. Moody was saying about the struggles with the childcare workforce. Within the last about 10 to 14 days, there have been two national articles on the struggles in the childcare workforce. Both the New York Times and the Washington Post both had articles here recently that were forwarded to me by others around the struggles with child care. And it starts with the unfortunately um, low pay rates that many child care providers um, are paid for a time that is the most critical to a child's development and their future. Talking about futures, early childhood development, as many of you on this call know, lays the foundation for future success in school and more importantly, life. And uh, so some of those skill sets, Martina, you talked about when you're coaching professionals, when they you know get to your level, a lot of that was really learned in early childhood, problem solving, critical thinking, getting along with others, learning to share, learning to take turns, learning to contribute to a group effort, a group project. A lot of that in a well-constructed, well-designed, high-quality early childhood environment happens in those early years, and it's in the brain from now until forever. And then further education and life experiences build on that to create um, the young person that eventually walks into an employer or you know goes and invents something. Um, so I think that's important to continue to look at what can we do to place greater value on our child care workforce. Some of the ways we do that at Child Care Resources is to keep our training that supports professional development of child care providers at low to no cost. And we're only able to do that through the generosity of the community, through our contract with DHR, where we can keep our trainings low to no cost. And virtually, no pun intended, virtually all of our trainings now are virtual. And we do them in a variety of formats. We do live virtual, we do live hybrid, we do recorded sessions that are available for a limited time on demand. And so we're, we're adjusting and flexing to the needs of our primary audience child care providers. And uh, we're, we've found that in response to that, child care providers are taking more advantage of professional development. So 
we're helping to elevate the profession by saying you need to learn also, just like you're wanting to teach the children, you as the caregiver, you as the child care teacher, you need to be learning and growing also. And we're trying to make that as available and as accessible as possible um, with, again, evenings, weekends, daytime, recorded sessions that are available for one to two weeks sometimes to give everyone the maximum opportunity to really take advantage of professional development. We also even have retreats from time to time for child care professionals to, again, take that opportunity to step back, do some self-care, some self-reflection, and evaluate what can I achieve in this moment? How can I attend to myself in this moment so I can be the best I can for the children and families in care? And I think, finally, um, to your question, supporting families is even more critically important now because Families are just as both, again, Dr. Houston and Dr. Moody outlined in today's session, families are struggling with a lot more than they had before. And I, I hesitated to, to put this in the chat earlier because I'm, I'm not a psychological professional, um, but it sounds to me like the stress we're enduring from this pandemic, work um, fluctuations, work instability, family fluctuations, family instability, education instability. To me, it's very similar to um, like a post-traumatic stress disorder because it's prolonged. You know, like Dr. Houston said earlier, healthy stress is like, oh, I have a deadline to meet or I've got to, you know, be here by that certain time or those are kind of healthy stress things. I'm getting ready to speak, you know, to a group of people. Those are healthy stressors. Um, but when you have this prolonged uncertainty, it increases anxiety levels, increases blood pressure. It, it just compounds, and there's very little outlets when you're told, stay home, stay away, you go back, do this, do that, um, don't do this, don't do that, now do this and do that. Um, it's very confusing, it's very stressing, and that kind of prolonged stress is, is literally unnerving. And we're all dealing with it, every, every one of us. Um, so it, it's very challenging to cope with as the person. It's very challenging to cope with in a caring role when you're caring for other people's children. And then families trying to do all of that as well and adjust and flex to the new routines and new expectations of childcare, all in the interest of health and safety for young children. Yeah, Joan, I think um, what you just shared is exactly what um, Dr. Moody was talking about experiencing um, with, with her parents as it's a lot, it's a lot, it's so much and, mm -hmm. and to that stress for them. And in some cases, and what we do as people, unfortunately, it's just how we're wired, right? Is sometimes we want to be defensive or we want to back off or we want to say, well, I'm not going to do that. And it's just in an, in, in an effort or a space of there's so much uncertainty, people don't know. Um, and I hear people say all the time, I just want to get back, nor get back to, to, to normal. And I'm like, yeah, that, that is no more. It's a new normal. What is our new normal and what is our future? So I want to shift um, gears a little bit. And I think this this here really hit hard for a lot of people. And Joan, you talked a little bit about this. But um, Dr. Houston, I would love for you to take this one because I think that this is really what you've had to deal with with a lot of the families um, that you help to support. You know, many families are experiencing financial challenges. Um, you know, we've had um, people and, and families furloughed from jobs, um, jobs completely shutting down and not reopening their doors. You've had folks, you know, flex with finances just to be able to make ends meet. Then there's been housing instability um, because of some of the financial, um, you know, downsides that, that's come across. And then the, the most heartbreaking, because this is, of course, um, where we're not able to, to provide for children the way we want to and families is the food insecurity. Um, and we've seen, you know, some areas and communities really step up. And in some cases, families might not have even the access to get um, the, the things that they need. Um, and again, all of this affects our children's overall health and well-being. Um, parents and caregivers stress weighs on the whole family and can lead to greater mental health challenges for children. So I would love to hear um, from you, Dr. Houston, what resources are available to support the well-being of parents, child care providers, and families with young children that might be dealing with some financial um, and food insecurities and, and support needed? 
Okay, well, you know, from that standpoint, and what I think all that we have all shared up to this point is that a lot of things over these past, you know, 18 months have really put a strain. Some things have closed down, never reopened, you know, just a variety of different things that happen. You know, um, from my standpoint, you know, I always look at with everything that, you know, you were talking about, um, Martina, in terms of, okay, you food, lack of it, not knowing where to get it, if there are food banks, where do you go? You know, do you have access to even get there? Um, everything from um, even, again, childcare or lack thereof, or what do you do? Dr. Moody talked about, you know, um, some parents are just overwhelmed, like, this is too much. You know, I can't do all of this as well. Um, some of the things, um, you know, in terms of, I guess, from the standpoint, and I'm going to, one of the things that I would like to do, um, I have some, um, like, different community organizations that could help as well, but also I will send this, um, Joan, to you, if you could put it, like, on the, I guess, website or whatever, so people will have access to it, um, you know, with some of it to see if it fits for them, but, you know, Again, me as being from the, I always, I always, no matter what, think about the impact from the, the, the internal, the psychological, the stress, you know. And one of the things that I think about is that if we can help and get the needed um, services, the needed help to families, that is going to help reduce a lot of stress. So one of the things is that I always think about is to prioritize. What are the priorities that you need to look at? And then you go from that standpoint. And if honestly, if you rank them, okay, well, one of the main things is going to be what? Safety, food, those types of things. So you prioritize that. And then you start looking for um, different agencies. Like, um, honestly, child care resources, you know, that you would be able to actually have um, a linkage to a variety of different services that you can call. Um, some of them, you know, in terms of when I was looking at this, and I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, Joan and Dr. Moody, you may already know or even um, know more services. So if you do, please chime in because I couldn't give them all, right? But again, I look at places like, um, and I did not write, it's out of UAB, it's, um, it's a resource that if you call, and the um, letters is P-I-R-C, but it looks at, Joan, are you familiar with P-I-R-C? Yes, but it actually, you know, you call in, you say what it is that you're needing um, in terms of for, for your child, for services, and then they can then um, give you a list to different providers for that. And so I think that is one thing that um, if we could, increase anything is more of those types of um, agencies or places that you can call, especially if it's based in your community, that you can call, get the word out. And then if you call for assistance, then they can give you a variety of different places to go based on your need. You know, places like um, the Oasis Center um, that, you know, provide a variety of different things. Everybody's shaking their head in terms of knowing about Oasis, you know, very good. Um, even like for, um, um, is JBS Children's Services. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with JBS, but again, providing um, needed everything from, especially if it's related to like mental health and behavioral, you know, helping even possibly with um, in-home, um, services as well. And today, you know, I know that would look different, but at least, you know, in terms of even if it's like virtual, that you would be able to get some type of assistance. Um, you know, one of the things in terms of, and I'll have, because I've been looking for a specific type of bereavement counseling, because I've worked with people that they say over the past 18 months, they've had five family members, um, you know, that have passed on from COVID. Um, or even other things. I can't, I mean, if we admit, if we can think about, um, you know, someone just not related to the pandemic prior to the um, pandemic or COVID that passed, that is an intensely emotional um, type of situation. And imagine close relatives that um, 
and are passing away sometimes within days of each other. You know, that impacts again, everyone from the, um, the caregiver all the way down to the children, especially, you know, if they were close. So we have to think about all of these things when we're talking about helping and reducing. Um, also at children's behavioral health is also another. I honestly can say it from this standpoint, I know in terms of some services, they may have a wait list, but in terms of also looking at it um, from the standpoint of getting um, mental health services and care, um, you know, from that as well. And um, in terms of, again, specifically like with local um, food banks, again, I'll have lists, Joan, again, to give that you'll be able to um, put out as well. So there are agencies, again, not everything, not every agency is going to meet everyone's need. And, you know, you're going to have to search and look and investigate um, until you find, you know, what to get your needs met. So, but it's challenging. I'll be honest with you, you know, it's challenging for that. Thank you, Thank Dr. Houston. And Yes, go ahead. I, I put a few things in the chat too, in addition to what you were saying. And um, when you send us that resource list, yeah. if it's okay with you, if there's some additional ones that we may think of to add, yeah. that's okay. Oh, yeah. um, we'll add that and, and we can promote that um, through our website, maybe even through our blog and, and of course through social media too. Um, so yes, those are always helpful. Um, and and it, usually when you're in crisis, you, you're struggling with your cognitive function skills, as you know, yeah. and it's hard to think of things that you may know about in regular times, like, oh, yeah, you can just rattle off all these places. But then when you like need something, you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't think of a single place to go for help. That's why it would be good to keep this resource list posted. Um, and yeah. we, we will certainly do that. So thank you for preparing that. OK. So thank you. That is a great resource. Um, Dr. Moody would love to hear from you as we think about increased access to child care um, and how that will enable greater um, parental workforce participation, because we recognize that could be a barrier um, mm -hmm. for a family. Um, and also think about the impact of what we were speaking on earlier around just the financial insecurities and instability. When parents have access to high quality, affordable child care, which I, we heard your thoughts is we shouldn't even be paying for child care, but that, that's another panel and another, <laughs> another conversation. Right. Um, and, and employer benefits um, as we think about reduced absenteeism. And again, for someone that's a, a human resources leader in, in a corporate organization, these are things that, that we hear from our employees as well. Um, you know, what can you share um, as you know, share about the challenges your early um, your early learning center may have faced in the past year, and how have you all managed um, to really help bridge that gap and remove some barriers for those families? Um, it, it's communication. You know, we just try to really communicate, communicate, communicate. We tell them up front. I know this is difficult. I know this is hard, but um, this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. You know. Um, and that's all it is, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing more, nothing less, you know, we know there are challenges, you know, um, but this is kind of what it is. We have to do, um, we have to be consistent across the board and that's important as well. So it's not one sided, it's not, I'll do this for you and do this for someone else. So it, it you know, so um, consistency, communication and, um, and just really listening, you know, you know, sometimes, we you know we all get frustrated in moments, but you know, parents want to be heard and they want to, you know, they want to know that we listen, that we care. You know, one of the things I tell our staff, we're a nonprofit organization as well, and we are a Christian school. And I tell my team, we're a ministry. So, you know, our job is to minister to our families while we are, you know, teaching our children, but we are ministering to our families. So when they're communicating their frustrations. We are really ministering to our families. So we are listening and we are hearing their concerns and their heart on the matter. And we listen and we hear and we say, we understand we're gonna hold to our rules, but we're gonna, we're gonna hear them out. And, but we're gonna stick to our rules and we're gonna, we're gonna be consistent. We're gonna communicate, but we're gonna listen to them. So those are a few things that we do. 
there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of empathy, um, especially as we go back to that stress from, from parents. And sometimes that's exactly what they need for someone to stop and listen and show, um, and show a level of care and know that there's someone here to, to, to help them. So I think that uh, we definitely appreciate that. And most times they'll actually come back and say, you know, I'm sorry, I was just frustrated. You mm -hmm. know, I was in the moment, you know, I know, I know there's nothing you can do about it, but I just was so frustrated in the moment. And we're like, we get it. We know it's not personal. You know, yeah. it's just in the moment you're frustrated. You have to go back home with your two-year-old. I get it, you know, yeah. or whatever it may be in the moment. But so, yeah. Good call out. Joan, I know you you touched on this very briefly, so we'd love for you to, to take a minute just to talk about some of the support that we have received um, from a financial standpoint. You know, in March last year, we had um, a federal government set aside um, nearly $734 million for child care and support um, in our state to, to help to, to stabilize funding for various purposes, such as paying rent, um, personal protection equipment, um, and as well as mental health support to children and to staff. In your experience, how has the American Rescue Package or other federal funding programs been used in your field to help support families and children? Great, thank you. And I know we're um, running close on time. I do want to leave a minute or two for questions. Um, so just real quickly, um, many of you have read in the news um, or seen on the news that um, there's been all these millions and millions of dollars pouring in to various places to help offset a lot of the stressors that we've been talking about, food insecurity, housing, um, paying for you know typical things like childcare expenses. And so a lot of that money was funneled into very specific entities. For example, DHR in our state was one of those recipients. And then they um, set forth plans and purposes for using that money and distributing it. So, for example, in Alabama, DHR, as I mentioned earlier, made adjustments to the child care subsidy program, where they are now um, covering 100 percent of the parent fees for the child care subsidy program. And they have increased their income limit so that now more families are eligible to apply. And again, this is helping child care providers if they have families that are being subsidized through the child care subsidy, they're getting those payments on a regular basis. Whereas if families are making those on their own and they're having some of their own financial challenges, like we mentioned earlier, that payment may not be as consistent. This is one way to get the full payment consistent. And that's available right now, at least to the end of the year. They also made grants available to child care providers twice now in our state to again help offset some of the cost. Um, Head Start providers like ourselves, we are now a Head Start provider in Jefferson County. We received additional funding um, through COVID through the um, ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds, as well as the CARES Act funds previously. And we've been using those primarily to uh, support the continuing health and safety protocols like Dr. Moody said, through PPE equipment, cleaning supplies, different things like that. Um, so you may want to check with, um, you know, some other entities in your community. Also for groups with, that are serving people, children and adults with disabilities. There's been a lot of um, efforts made to enhance and support resources for people with disabilities. So you may want to check with um, some of the disability serving entities and ask them, how how are your funds being utilized and how can they be accessed? So those are some key things is to know who may be the recipient of those funds and then um, reach out to them. Right now, cities and municipalities, school systems have also benefited. You can talk to them. How are you using your funds? Are any of those funds available to support early childhood, to support families? Um, so you really have to ask. It's not readily and easily accessible. You can't just as a random person usually, or even a, uh, just a standard business, you can't really directly apply a lot of times for those funds. You have to work through the entity that was the recipient of those funds to access them. So it does require a little bit of asking and investigating. And as that information becomes available to us, we often put it out through social media or on our website. Thank you, Joan. 
so in an effort to allow opportunity for um, our guests that have joined us this afternoon to ask any questions, I know I did drop a, a, a quick note in the chat. If you had any questions, you're more than welcome to drop them. Or if you would like to come on mute and ask a question of, of our panelists in the last few minutes um, we have, please feel free to do so. Um, while we are waiting, and feel free to raise your hands, so I'll make sure that you're ready to ask a question. Um, I would like to ask our panelists kind of their final thoughts um, that you would like to leave um, leave our folks with today of as you think about all the things that we've had to deal with over the last year and a half. Um, if there's one thing you could share with our families as they think about future what would that one thing be that you would like to share? Um, and Dr. Moody, I'll start with you while we wait for folks to raise their hand and, and potentially ask some questions. I think the one thing I would share is trust your early childhood providers. They are there to serve you. They are there to um, provide for your children and your families. And I would trust them wholeheartedly and um, I think you will be very well pleased if you're in a, a program that is a, like Jonah says, very well, a high quality um, care program that that is doing right by by you and your family. So just trust them. Thank you, Dr. Houston. Yes. Okay. Um, one of I guess if it's one thing. Um, I would start off by saying, be true to yourself, be true to your family, know where you're at, figure out where you're at and what your needs are. And from there, then the best thing, even though it's a whole sea of chaos, the best thing, honestly, is to plan and prioritize and go from there. That would help reduce the level of stress, your ability to see things clearer, your ability to move forward, even if it's baby steps, it's not going backwards. So that is, I guess, would be the main thing. Joan? Okay, I, I'm going to be really fast. I'm going to sneak in two things. Okay, so number one is this. Smile, which we've been doing a lot of on this. You all have beautiful smiles. It increases your face value. It reduces your blood pressure. It makes others around you either curious as to what you're smiling about or it'll be contagious and they'll start smiling too and have those benefits. So that is free to everyone and it really can uplift um, so many spirits just by smiling at people. I know we're often behind masks, but even when you smile, you can a little bit see it in your eyes and your cheeks. So, you know, um, give that to people. It's free. And then the last thing is it's in your hands. We talked a lot about self care. Um, I like to say your health is in your hands. We still want to encourage hand washing. We want to encourage your hands to put healthy things in your body, healthy foods, healthy nutrients, healthy thoughts in your brain. That also helps reduce stress and, and reduce anxiety. And it helps you to think clearer, to clear out some of that clutter. So like Dr. Houston said, you can prioritize and then make steps forward that way. So it's in your hands and it's on your face, so smile and take care of yourself. Thank you so much. So virtual claps for Dr. Muti, Dr. Houston, and Joan Wright, Executive Director of Child Care Resources. Thank you all so much for joining us on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Uh, there's so many resources out there for you, so please know you are not in this alone. We are all here to help you. I'm Martina Winston. It has been my pleasure facilitating and moderating this panel, um, and hope you'll join us for our next coffee um, with the Executive Director coming soon. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.